Yes, people, what's happening? And welcome to the Frankie Allen podcast with your host, Will Cranny, alongside the UK's most feared comedian, Frankie Allen. Frank, how are you doing today? I'm doing great today. Went to Birmingham on Tuesday. The procedure on my hair, on my head. Have you ever heard of the scalp pigmentation? I've had it done before a few years ago. But now um, it starts to fade after a few years. What is it for anyone who's... You, well, you're bald, you, yeah? If you're bald, if you're losing your hair and you don't like the look of it, you can get kind of a tattoo on your head. It's called, called scalp pigmentation. It's a very good procedure, very painful when it gets done. But it'll give you the appearance of having a full head of hair, but it's shaved. Yeah. And it's very good. I've had it for years. And I've, I've liked it. You know, the only problem with it is if you sunbathe, and I love sunbathing, if you don't put factor 50 on your hair, it can fade quite quickly. Yeah. Uh, with the ultraviolet rays of the sun. So it's never really faded because I've always covered my hair until this year. I just couldn't be bothered and I didn't think it'd fade and it faded very quick. So I've had to go down to Birmingham to his hair clinic and uh, they've done it all again. Good plug for them. Let's just talk about that. Anyone who's listening who might be bald or, yeah. you know, this is in no way sponsored whatsoever. It's not sponsored by anybody. But, but curious, I mean, so. any men out there and, and women as well, of course, but, you know, unless you were, women wouldn't really suit it very short. With the men, if you're losing your hair and you've tried Regain, which is a product, it's minoxidil, and it's supposed to regrow your hair, and I've tried that, but it only grows your hair back, say, 20%. Is that finasteride? Fen- no, finasteride is something else. Yeah. Finasteride, or Propecia, as it's known, its brand name, is a female hormone, estrogen. Um, when you lose your hair... Why you're losing your hair is because you're such, you're so manly, really. You've got loads of testosterone. So the testosterone is actually like flowing out of your radiator, if you know what I mean. You filled it, you filled too much with testosterone, so it comes through onto your skin. And on your skin, it's called dihydrotestosterone. Yeah, DHT. DHT, and it kills the hair follicle. That's why a lot of guys who are bald are like. Really big guys, strong yeah, people. Yeah, it's a different way, though. Some people go bald because of bad circulation. No, it's a well, tinge of a factors. medical thing. But the reason no, that people no, well, go bald from the front, yeah. come back, mine's stopped, by the way. Uh, I was panicking about mine a few years ago. It's because of the DHT. It's all DHT. And it's, because it's not all DHT. Well, I don't argue with you. I've, I've studied this for 30 years. You know what's trying to, like, I call would, me out. We'll do the research after this. Any medical doctors in the comments? What the fuck? I know, I know what I'm talking about. I've had like loads of procedures. It's yeah, DHT. It's DHT on the you. Ca- if you've got bad circulation, it can compound it, make it worse. But just if you have poor circulation, there's fellas of 80 and 90 in hospital who've got poor circulation with big heads of hair. No, there isn't. So they all lose their hair if you've got bad circula- circulation. Poor circulation in people means that the blood circulation will be less likely to get to the follicle of the hair. And then it falls out. Anyway, well, that could be anyway. a factor, but it's a, the main thing is everyone generally accepted by the top scientists of the world, and you're not one of them. Neither are you. It's DHT. Neither are you. So anyway, I've researched it. Tell me about when did you start losing your hair, and how long have you not had started hair losing my hair? I was about 20, 21. and I noticed I was living in this flat in Waverley in Liverpool, and uh, I've been through a little bit of a bad time. Had to leave home and things. So I was getting kind of like a bath and washing my hair and things. And I had a mirror. I was just looking at the back of my head. I was like, fucking hell. I could see like a tiny spot like a coin Mm. right at the crown of my head. And I thought, that's weird. There's no hair on it. (laughs) I thought, how strange is that? Yeah. So I kind of like... 21, yeah? 21. So I kept an eye on it. And then a few months later, it, it just seems to be getting a bit bigger. Then down here on my hairline, at the edges, it seems to be kind of like going back. So that carried on. By the time I was very gradually, by the time I was 30, there was a lot of hair missing at the back and the front had receded and it was terribly thin. So the first, first thing I did, this was like 1985, started researching things about it and found out about Regain, which wasn't in, on the market then. It was this uh, minoxidil, and it was got to be the great cure. Everyone did you was have, have you ever about. worn a wig before that? No. no. 
So, signed him in Oxidil. Yeah, I had to go to this place in Manchester to get it. You couldn't really get it in England. It was illegal to get it. And you had to get it through Spain and all this. And it did work to an extent. It stopped your hair, look, you know, any further hair falling out. And it, it regrew your hair. But how it regrew, it was weird. You had to be dead patient because it'd take a year. Because when it regrew, it regrew as baby hair, like going back to when you were a kid. Yeah. Then that eventually fell out after six months. Then normal hair regrew. So it's the cycle of losing your hair. You know that when you do lose your hair, it's always replaced by hair, which is shorter and weaker. Okay. So that in the end, from having very strong hair, you're losing it, losing it. Different cycles. In the end, you have hair called vellus hair, which is transparent. You can see right through it. You don't even know it's there. Mm. Got no colour in, no melanin, nothing. So it's very quite complicated. But on a kind of like appearance basis... I know, you know, I'm a kind of an average lad. I know how people think. I know a lot of lads have been really worried and really fucked up because they're losing their hair. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've looked into kind of decide, every method of, of re- regaining it. You didn't ever decide to shave it, though, before you had the procedures done. What were you, what else were you doing? Throwing this thickness stuff on top of it? I had this stuff. It's called uh, hair building fibres. Oh, wait, there before that. Did the minoxidil not really work that, that well? Well, I said earlier, you know, it works, but only like 25% regrowth and the rest, it stops your hair falling out. Oh, ah, okay. And it's baby hair that comes back. It's very fine. It, you'd have to wait two or three years before you actually got strong hair back again, but it's not all it's cracked up to not be. the answer. Yeah. So what was this hair thickening thing? Well, hair thickening, what it does, it's like, well, are you saying the piss here? <laughs> oh, no, no, see What are you fucking laughing at? What? It's like a pepper pot full of these electrostatically charged fibres which cling to your existing hair like a bird building a nest and it builds up the appearance of a head of hair. What did, what did you think of that? It was quite good. Yeah. It kind of like at the back of the hair, you couldn't see any baldness in the front. The only problem was, as time was going on, I was getting like 30, 40. The hair that I had on the head, that could thicken up. But you can't thicken it if there's none there. So the forehead is kind of shrinking back all the time. So I was like, in the end, like Mr. T. Fowl. I was like Mag- Michael Barrymore with a fucking big head. Like that. Yeah. Fucking big, big head, like a shovel. And all this, like, hair on the top of it. So I looked like Ernie from Sesame Street. Bert. Bert. Bert from Sesame Street. Bert from Sesame Street. So the day came when you came to ours and said... I'm thinking of having this procedure done. I've already been to Manchester. I've looked into it. How did you find I out? I came into your house and I went, Hi, Ernie. <laughs> no, go ahead. Because you said to me, you said that... that I was you watching the telly one out. night. Yeah. So this programme about a fella who had operations on his head and he had scars all over his head and he didn't know how to kind of like get round it. And he was in a place in Birmingham, the same place I was in on Tuesday. And the TV programme was showing him getting the procedure done, saw him before and after, and I thought it looked great. But they never said where it was mm. or what the fucking firm was called. So I just didn't know. Make a documentary or So something. a documentary, I taped it, and I kept watching it, and then in the kind of read it backwards in a door, the glass of a door, it said his clinic, his hair clinic, so I checked it out on the internet, found out and rang them up. Did you go down before you spoke to me about it? Well, I know you're a super critic. Will gives me a terrible time over a lot of things. He always has done. So I knew if it passed his quality control nah, test. Just very, very black and white me. <laughs> so he Oh, came... it's very cruel. So cruel I knew enough. that if I would have oh, got it... Oh, if I'm cruel, go ahead. Unbelievably cruel. If I would have got it done and it wouldn't have looked 110% authentic... He would have persecuted me the rest of my life. So what I had to do was go down, have a look at it. And then I had to say to the guy, look, I'll bring my son with me next time. We'll come down. And if he kind of like gives it the okay, he'll get it done. I was just sat there. We went down to Manchester one day. I'm proper like, oh, as if you're going to get a tattoo on your head, it'll look proper snide. And um, I was sat there and the fellow was like saying, oh, we've got these officers in Australia. 
Manchester and blah blah. In the blah. states, all over the world now. And I was like, "Have you got yours done?" And he was like, "Yeah." And I was like, "Fucking get it done then. Looks great. Look great." And does has it changed your life? That was Danny. Like that? Danny is one of the uh, practitioners there now, Manchester Danny. But it's changed my life to the extent that uh, I don't feel embarrassed like I used to. You know, you could get ready to go out on stage and buy a thousand pound suit, top of the range designer shoes and a shirt. But if there's no fucking air there, you can't get it permed, you can't comb it, there's nothing you can do. So what do you do, just shave it? Well, I was lucky. I'm very lucky, really, because nowadays, it's kind of not fast. It's kind of very much more acceptable than it was to have your head shaved. Mm. A lot of guys who had hair and who've got hair now shave the hair like Zidane, you know, the footballer. And it's a good effect. You can see the hairline. So you know the guy's not bald, and you can see the kind of follicles, the hair follicles trying to regrow and break through. You're just kind of like a marine, so or a soldier. So it's a good effect, and it looks good. Yeah. So you're pleased with it. So we went down to Birmingham this week, got well, it topped up. Well, I got it topped up. I got it redone really because it, it faded an awful lot. But it only faded this year because I'm always in the garden and I didn't wear a hat. And I didn't really put any sun cream on, so it was my own fault. Yeah, it does. It has changed your appearance a little bit, like. In what way? Um, it just it, the the top looks a lot darker. It looks more legit than it used to. I didn't realize how like faded it was. Yeah, very faded, yeah. Like, like but the uh, thing is, you see, it doesn't really look how it should look at the moment because I can't shave it. So you can't shave it after you've had the procedure for three or four days, um, and you can't get it wet or anything. So got it done on Tuesday. 28th to 30th today, two days. So possibly tomorrow we'll shave it off or maybe Saturday. Nice one. So back to work soon. We had the announcement that August 1st was supposed to be back under government legislation. Live events were allowed to return. It's been a little bit strange. The venues that I've been speaking to, um, everyone in the industry is just a little bit flummoxed by it because they don't know where, what the fucking legislation is, basically. Well, the legislation, as everything else has been this year from the government, it's just not very clear at all. People don't really know whether they can put shows on or they can't. Mm. Can they put shows on if you're, like, six feet away or have you got to do shows which are outside? Can you work inside the building? Well, they've said... What's they, the capacity to be 300 can, people? They've said you can do shows inside yeah. so long as social distancing has taken place yeah. and then other people are saying you can only have it if it's less than 30 people it's just mad so anyway we, we, had, a mean, big, we had a big show tomorrow the, the night the government I, mean, they've, they've, I think they've been quite good the government's over this far as, but they've never been clear all the government instructions and government's advice and direction had never been clear over whether you know they go on and ramble on about I think it was, um, who's that comedian? And He's like a bald guy. He, he'd done a video about them skitting at them, didn't oh, he? Oh, I know what you mean. And uh, it was very, Lucas. Matt Lucas. Matt Lucas. And I don't really like Matt Lucas, because I think he's a bit of a snob and things. I don't like snobs. But when I saw the thing that he did about Boris Johnson, it was very good, and it really summed up the government's advice and, and the government's policy. He was, you know, he, he was dressed up as Boris Johnson, and he was going, you know, this is the government's advice this week. Go out, go out, enjoy yourself. Don't go out. Stay in. Yes, you can stay in as long as there's one person in your family who's with you, but you must be on your own. But go out, but don't stay in. Of course you can go to the chemist. Don't go to the chemist. You must pick up your prescription at the supermarket. But you can't go to the supermarkets, of course. Things will have to be limited. But you can go out, but you must be with three other people. But you must be alone. You must be on your own. And he'd done the voice and everything. It was fucking fantastic the way he'd done it. But although it was very funny and it was a piss take, it, I thought it was very, very true, mm. very accurate about the way the government's behaving. Nobody knows, even now, what the fucking policy is. Are we working again or aren't we working? Yeah, well, it was supposed to be working from August 1st. We had a big show in Wigan tomorrow night, July 31st, which is basically I did 250 tickets for it and then I halted it because I thought we might be able to do it at half capacity. Yeah. 500 capacity, then you do it at half capacity, then obviously missed it by a fucking day, so we're going to have to put that back. We're meant to be in the Isle of Man next week as well. It's fucking heartbreak. Instead, we've decided it's, it's to... It's got uh, me kind of like, I'm dead ratty and everything today. I just feel as though, like a lot of people now, you just begin 
to lose heart completely. Oh, we've got a big outdoor show next week. Yeah, because you think, well, am I ever going to work again? What the fuck is going on? Mm. You go like to, I haven't worked since March, so March, April, May, June, July, August. It's six fucking months where I haven't made a penny. No work at all. I love being on stage. I'm sitting in a fucking house like a hermit every weekend. It's just horrible. Mm. And like every month he said, and everyone, the rumours going round, you can work next week, two weeks' time, they're going to make an announcement tonight. And it's just dragging on. And I've noticed a lot of people aren't going out anymore now. They kind of lost heart, even kind of like wanting to go out. I mean, people are that pissed off. They're just staying in fucking bed. You say that though, we sold a load of tickets for next week's show. We've got one show, Will, but you know... We, well, it's we, strange that because the guy approached me, basically we're doing a big show and it's the it's in the enclosed grounds of the Isle of Gladstone. It's like an outdoor show in Liverpool. Really? Set, like It's like, not city centre, is it, but just outside. Everyone would know where it was. It's Goodison Park oh, and everything. It's Goodison yeah. Park, yeah. And when the guy approached me to do the show, he's like, look, we can do it outdoor, we can do it social distanced. And then the legislation came out and we're doing it on August 8th. And I thought, ah, oh, fucking hell. We could have been doing an indoor show then, but no, we can't by the by the sounds of things. So I'm made up that we actually took it. Well, we took it because everyone was saying, as you said a couple of weeks ago, from August 1, August the 1st, we're up and running, back to normal. It's not like that at all. No, mm. no one's clear about, you know, and, and even kind of like, you know, the, the, the closing down various cities, Leicester, I think it was, was it Bradford or Blackburn, that they closed down for a while. They brought the... In, Initial, the very first restrictions, quarantine, mm. that we all went through in March where you just couldn't go out. They've done that in certain towns where they've had outbreaks like Leicester and Blackburn. So we're still at the mercy of the government, even if it goes back to normal. If you get a city that we're working in, gets a big outbreak, it'll just be closed down. It can't work. Yeah. I think the furlough thing's a bit of an issue as well because, especially in the entertainment industry, if you've got a big venue with a lot of staff and they've got a lot of staff on furlough and the furlough ends in October, you're not going to send half the staff back off furlough if you can only make half the money. And it's like... Yeah, but we'll, no, the other thing is this. The, go the government have conned people. A lot of people I've spoken to that decide to get these government grants, 10 grand, grand, what is it, fucking throwback or some fucking thing, 20 grand, a grand furlough. Bounce back. Bounce fucking back. Nobody gets it. Because all they do, they say it's available. But, you know, they put a lot of loopholes in the application where if you put your tax return in a bit late, like I did, they fuck you off, they won't pay you. And loads of people I've spoken to, they wouldn't pay me because of this, they wouldn't pay me because of that. So the governments have been fucking, like, very mean, really. It's like anything else. You know, there's a kind of, like... They'll say you can, you know, you, you can get this and you get that, but they make it very, very difficult to qualify. Nice one. So just to lift the mood a little bit, we had a, we've got a topic for today. Before I say that, it's like, a depressing topic, by the way. Nah, he's saying I'm lift the mood. I think it's a good topic. I think people are going to enjoy it. So today we've already been on for like about fifteen minutes, but we're going to introduce today's topic. And the day today's topic is, I think a lot of people will like it. I want to ask Frank about all of the times that he's died on stage. And let's oh, just outline. Let's just I out, don't need this. Let's just, out, really don't let's need just this. outline first. In the comedy world, oh. what does it mean to die on stage? Right. To die on stage. When you die on stage, you're introduced to an audience on stage. If you don't connect with the audience and nobody laughs, you're standing there telling your gags, doing your routines, doing impressions, whatever you do to try and make them laugh. If the whole room, like 500 people, are just sitting there looking at you, very quietly sometimes, you, you, you feel as though you're dying, literally. I mean, I've never died, obviously, in my life. Yeah. But it's such a horrible feeling. And you can go out on stage and talk and do your gags, and the audience think you're rubbish. So they're all talking, and all you can hear is this big noise, like a football match, like the cop. All you hear is a terrible noise. And what they're talking about is that you're rubbish. And you can hear them all going, he's rubbish, this fella. Listen to his jokes, it's fucking awful. They're all talking while you're on, and you just ignore, they just blank you, 
And you just die. You can die for loads of different reasons as well, can't you? <laughs> die for yeah, a bad intro. Well, <laughs> there's a few different reasons why you can die. I've died thousands of times on stage. Some of them ended up where the deaths have been quite funny. In what way? Like, it's, it's, you'd have to be working on the clubs of the comics to, to experience what I've experienced. Some, there's a good example of it, some people in the old social clubs, labour clubs, conservative clubs, who are concert secretaries and compares, who compare the evening, because they're a bit local and you know everyone that's in the crowd, they used to get very jealous of the comics. Mm. So what a lot of them would do is go on stage, eight o'clock before the comic comes on, and they're watching comics every week. There used to be a comedian on every week at the time, and all the clubs had comedians on. So they'd pinch a load of material, they'd come out and they'd do a comedy spot to try and ruin it for the comedian coming on at nine o'clock. Yeah. So that they were seen as like, oh, like, Freddie was dead funny, wasn't he? No, they're just trying to make sure you die. So that everyone thinks because they're Because the they're the big name in the club. So-and-so is the compere. He's a big noise and he's dead important and he feels great because he's walking around this local club. So they don't want an actor come in from the outside and get a better reception what they get and get a better name than what they've got. So they'll sabotage what you're doing. It happened to me with a fellow called Frankie Barrow, who's the MC. He's probably dead now anyway, but I don't give a fuck about him. <laughs> I'll tell you the story. Yeah. This is what he'd done to me. You can ask your mum this, because this was the first time I'd ever took your mum out. Now imagine you meet someone, you meet a bird and you're taking it out for the first time. You tell her that you're a great comedian and you're a big time. You're all that social... By the way, this just when my dad had met my mum, you just come off the telly, weren't you? So you were hot property. On 1987? The yeah. You were like flying. Flying? Yeah. <laughs> so go on. Anyway. So she's come to see, she came to see me. By dad. the way, leave this in. Don't fucking cut this I'm out because I mentioned the fella's name because no. the fella's a fucking prick. Fuck I'll that. tell him. My mum went met me dad because she saw him on the telly. No, I knew your mum 10 years before. Yeah. And she knew it was a comic. And I'd been out with your mum and a mate of mine, Cockney Mick, the four of us had been out. He'd been out with Sandra. Yeah. And um, we just went out one Sunday to the fairground in Southport South and things. We, we knew each other like as kind of friends. I'd been out with your mum a couple of times, brought her home, dropped her off in a taxi at your house. A couple of things like that. But, but I didn't see her for 10 years then. And then one of her mates, things, Sandra, phoned up and said, remember Frankie, Frankie Allen? He's on Opportunity Talk, Knox next week on the telly, I believe. It's in the radio time. So she watched me. And then I was working on a club. It was called the Kiss Club. The club in... Um, Crosby. The Crosby. Ferndale Lodge. Ferndale Lodge. By the club. Plaza, if anyone knows in Liverpool. So your mum turned up there and I said, fucking hell. And this girl saw me. I said, it's fucking lovely, this girl. I didn't realise it was your mum who had forgotten about it. Mm. Anyway, so I made a date with her. So the first time we're going out together, I'm working on this Goose Green Labour Club. Where in Wigan. It? Okay. So we got in there early, everything's great. And it was a big night because there was a big group on called the Searchers. They were a huge group in the 60s. And they had like loads of number ones. They were like the Beatles. Mm. So the plan for the evening was for me to go on a half past eight before the Searchers, they were the top of the bill. And as a comic, I know when I walk in, walking at half seven, quarter to eight, eight o'clock, the audience were brilliant. Yeah. I could have gone on and brought the fucking house down. Okay. So this Frankie Barra fella is just like hanging the latch, wouldn't put me on, wouldn't put me on. Gets to 20 past eight. He goes on and does 45 minutes of comedy where people are laughing for half an hour. Then they get fed up. They all start talking. He starts dying. Everybody gets up to go to the bar. They put all the house lights up. The place is dead bright. The fucking crowd, instead of being quiet are just like a football game. The noise is terrible. He done it all on purpose, deliberately. Grabbed the mic and said, here's your, here's your comedian, Frankie Allen. While they're at the bar. While they're all at the Classic. bar. I went on. No one took a blind bit of notice. It just died mm -hmm. with the crowd that I knew I could have brought the house down if he would have put me on at the time I was supposed to go on. And he was just a fucking dickhead. I'm dying on the stage. He walked up to me and gave me a pork pie. Off the buffy, he thought that was funny. Why anyway, you were on stage? Did you fuck him off after? Fucked him off. 
when we came out, the actual chairman of the club came up to me and like said, Frankie, I'm terribly sorry what happened tonight. I saw what he'd done. It was just a prick. He didn't like the idea that I was getting the limelight and he wasn't. There's thousands but of fellas like that. It's just a it? cunt. I mean, I don't even care if he fucking wants to bring me up or whatever the fuck he wants to do. <laughs> just a fucking prick. Yeah. And he'd done it on purpose. And I'm thinking, you know, so embarrassed, humiliated. Not with just the crowd that took your mum out, thinking, you know, she'd be like all over me because it was a big night out. Yeah. And I just got in the car, I could hardly breathe. My fucking shirt was soaking wet because it died on stage. No, let me let me tell you this. Most people who have ever thought about being a comedian before, the thought of dying on stage outweighs the joy or the, you know, the what you would get from going down well, right? Yeah. To someone who has died on stage, for someone who has died on stage to tell everyone, how does it feel when no one laughs? Like, and you die badly. Well, when you go out, I used to be an impressionist when I first started. And uh, I used to come out with a suitcase full of props. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was only like 20, 21 when I started. So... I was kind of very, very inexperienced. I had some material, but I didn't have any good material. It was quite crap. The impressions were good. But I used to be doing impressions in the mic. Nobody was fucking laughing because the material was crap. Yeah, but you look young as well, so that doesn't help. All the crowds in social clubs at the time, labour clubs, conservative, all 45, 50 plus. Mm. A lot of them were in the fucking 70s. So I come out... Looking like a fucking two-year-old. I always looked young. Yeah. I look younger now than what I fucking am. But when I was 20, I looked about 13. <laughs> so I used to come out. I'd be dying everywhere. And I always used to remember, I'd turn round, go to my suitcase to take off, you know, a pair of glasses I'd been doing Cliff Richard. And I'd put a wig on and a beard. And the beard used to stick to my skin. And it'd go in my mouth mm. like a fucking tarantula. Because my mouth was so dry, it used to stick to my mouth because I wasn't getting any laughs. And you'd walk, I'd walk out to the mic, and what used to happen with me, a lot of places, when I was dying, <laughs> any comic that watches this will be laughing their head off now. This is what could happen to you. You face with four to five hundred people, none of them are fucking laughing at you. You feel as though you're in front of a firing squad. You can see people making little remarks, he's fucking awful, shaking their head, there's no one laughing. So you get very nervous, your mouth dries up, all your saliva's gone, your heart's beating like hell. In your mind, you're thinking, they're not going to pay me, they're not going to give me any money because they'd never pay you unless you brought the house down in these clubs. They're all fucking bastards. And then something would happen like your knees start like knocking and shaking or your foot would start like involuntary movements. You'd start going like that. Yeah. And then if you're really bad, it happened to me a few times, they'd just come and close the curtain on you. And as you're telling jokes, the curtain, they'd hit you on the side of the head. These were like big heavy curtains in clubs, twat you on the side of the head, you'd have to walk off, or the compare for the evening, I'd walk up to you and pull you, by get off, get off, pulling your pants, telling you to get off. <laughs> it was fucking horrible. Then you were in the dressing room, yeah. sitting in the dressing room, I used to get a rash on my chest when I died, and for the first few years I was dying everywhere. Fucking big rash on my chest, sitting there, like dying still, sitting there with all these bingo balls and Christmas lights in this tiny pokey dressing room. And I'm just sitting there like that, totally destroyed. And like, you'd have to get up the chair to be wringing wet. You'd have to wring your shirt out. Sometimes you're lucky, there was a door on the dressing room that led into the car park. So you could just fuck off, you could just run out the back, no one would see you. But after the comic was being on, they always had the bingo. So you had to finish doing your spot. You had to, like, get yourself dressed and walk through, like, a walk of shame where everyone in the club is doing the bingo, all the old women and men, but they just put their heads up and look at you, the adults, and say, you're fucking rubbish. Then you have to ask for your money, and most of the oh, time... Oh, they're always being weird. Oh, they're all being weird, saying, you only done 20 minutes, you should have been on 80 quid, 60 quid, we're only giving you 30. And then I wouldn't want to tell the agent that he hadn't paid me case they stopped me work, so they were still charging me commission, which they would owe the percentage of what I'd earned on like £80, but I only picked up £40. So you'd only make 20 quid on the fucking night in your petrol. Just a total nightmare. Yeah. 
Have you had any like really, really bad ones where it's like Oh, I've had I've had some terrible deaths and a lot of them are down to the MC. Like that Frankie Barrow fellow in Wigan who deliberately fucked me up. Mm. Some of them can ruin the night and ruin the comedian's performance by just being dickheads. For instance, I was on this place in Hull and uh, speaking to the comp here, the MC, and he went, and they're all dickheads, you know, in these clubs, these Labour clubs, Conservative clubs. They'll put you on, but they'll forget to put the lights on you. Oh, OK. So you're coming out in the dark. Over the years, I learned you had to go everywhere and tell them, put the lights on. Tell them everything. They're all retarded. Put the lights on. Switch the mic on when you bring me on. Mm. Tell everyone to sit down. Close the curtains if it was in the summer. You had to go through everything with them, like yeah, the children. Yeah, the weird thing, like, obviously, we know so many people who MC shows, host shows, and I host all the shows that we do. Yeah. But I'm actually, because I'm quite experienced at it, very good at getting people quiet. Most people can't, you have to have a quiet audience, really, when you come on, don't, can't you? That's like the Oh, no, I've worked thing. noisy audiences for years, and you can get them quiet as you're going on. I've worked audiences when, as you walk out... They're not laughing for the first 10 minutes. I've known an audience where I've been on stage dying for 25, 30 minutes. Then something come, goes up, absolutely walks in the club that they all know. I'll say something and all of a sudden you're bringing the house down. What I'm saying is, to for a uh, compare to get order before you go on, they need to have some kind of authority in the room because it makes it easier when you pick up the mic, doesn't it? Well, yeah. 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 So a lot of these fellas, as you were saying, if they're just fucking like, poor especially if you're a young lad coming on stage yeah you know you're gonna die by the intro sometimes don't you well, that's what i'm saying because what they used to do a favorite one was to do they say you're a comedian what time do you want to win nine o'clock okay mm. and i used to say to them, i'll let you know when i'm ready <laughs> so what they do did you're supposed to go on at nine o'clock five to nine as you're getting changed he was supposed to come in the dressing room and say to me, you're on now. It happened to me in Hull. Yeah. They'll just walk out and say, there's the comedian Frankie Allen. So you can't come out because you're not fucking dressed. Of course. So when you go out again, they don't want to know, the crowd don't want to know. They're just all talking. Because you've already been introduced. You've already been introduced and you haven't come out. And that does something to the crowd psychologically. So when you eventually come out the second time, they're not interested. You just talk. When you're on, you just die. Is there any places where... Before you even go to the venue or before you go to the location, you knew, fucking hell, that's going to be every day. Well, you had a lot of the clubs in the 70s and 80s used to get a bad reputation. If they'd been over-entertained, like the Dockers Club here in Liverpool, huge club, 500 people. Where is it? On Townsend Avenue. And, and on the stage, very high stage, you looked like a fucking fly. Mm. So you had to try and get your... But they had all the top acts on there for years and years and years. So then... When I was starting off, they'd have like Mick Miller, Stan Boardman, Mickey Finn, week after week after week, Eddie Collinson, Eddie Flanagan, George Roper, Bernard Manning, all the Ken Goodwin, all the top comics of the 70s and the 80s were on the clubs week after week after week. And then they didn't give a fuck. The agents would just put you in the club as a totally unknown comedian, mm. looking like a fucking little kid. So I just had a terrible time, really totally thrown in at the deep end. <laughs> so did it did it get to a point where, like, you know, you're first starting off, were you dying most of the time, half the time, or a lot of the time? Or what? 50% of the time. Yeah. Because I've always been very blue, the other 50% of the time, if I managed to get a decent introduction and I walked out and my material was rubbish, it was crap, but if somebody shouted out at me, even then I could come straight back at someone yeah, yeah, yeah. and say, fuck off, you dickhead. And with a kind of like working class crowd, you're always going to get laughs with that. So I used to play off the crowd in a lot of places and, and, and get some good laughs, which would kind of compensate for me not having any, I had no material really. I had virtually no script. And so it's so different to what it is now when I walk out. You know, I've only got to say, is this mic switched on? And people start laughing. Yeah. So it's just totally different. It's like... A, a lifetime away, isn't it? It's like 40 years ago, 45 years ago. And I've survived it and I've done it, but some very funny things have happened to me. What I used to do to try and make me money when I was on 200 quid the night just before Christmas, this fellow wanted me to do a club in Manchester. A fellow wanted me to do another club in Manchester. 
and a third club. And when I looked at the map, there was no sat nav then. They were all quite close to each other. Mm. So I thought, if I do those three fucking jobs, if I can stagger them, do one at eight o'clock, get to the next venue, ask them to put me on at nine, yeah. get to the last one and say my car broke down, put me on at ten, I can make 600 quid for the night. Yeah. Which even now is fantastic. So went to the first venue, had phoned up the second and third venue and told them it was going to be late. Got on at the first venue early, quarter to nine, went down well. 20 past nine, half nine, and coming off, to pay me the 200 quid. When I got to the second venue, the fella said, sorry, I've just put the group on. The group were on stage. And I said, I've got another gig to do. He went, they're not coming off till half past 10. So the group went off at half 10. I went on at 11 o'clock, 10 past 11, till half 11. So I got to the third club that I should have been on at nine o'clock. Yeah. It was a private do for this fucking company. Got to the third show at half 11, when I should have been on about 10. So as I walked in, the fellas moaning at me, where have you been? I looked at the crowd, they were all women really. Everyone was fucking dancing on the floor. Yeah, there's no way. There's no way that I was going to get one laugh. But I needed the money for Crimbo for yeah, Christmas. Yeah. So I thought, I've got 400, I might get the 200 here. So we're taking your chance. Sorry, is it worth taking your chance? Is that what you think? Yeah. So the DJ, any comic or any singer, anyone in the group, you only would have had to look at the room, and they were very late. We say in the in the business, a very very late crowd. The noise was horrendous. People were smoking at the time. Fucking smoke everywhere. Everyone was dancing. All these fucking old women. They weren't my kind of crowd. It was in a snobby area. I knew I wasn't going to get one fucking laugh. Mm. But I needed the cash. Yeah. So I went, okay. So this dickhead who's introducing me from this company, I looked in his top pocket, he had a brown envelope, which is the money. Yeah. And he said, go on now, it's half past 11, and take us right up to one o'clock. <sighs> While people are dancing, they cut the music off for cut you? Cut the well. music off. People took them 20 minutes to sit down, but they were still dead noisy. They didn't want a comedian. Instead then. of compare, they were saying, sit down, everyone sit down. Yeah, but it was gone. The room was gone. Yeah. Literally, some of the people, people were still standing there waiting for the next record to come on. Yeah. So I had to fucking go on anyway. Just before it went on, I saw, like a fucking hawk, because I'm used to it, for some reason, these dickheads that run clubs and functions... You always put your money in a brown envelope. Mm -hmm. Never a white one, it's weird. Okay. So this prick's got this brown envelope in his pocket. Yeah. And I got on it straight away. I thought, I'll see if I can get the money off this twat. <laughs> so I said to him, you got to pay me? And he went, oh, I'll pay you when you come off. I said, well, give us it now, I'll do you the good thing. So he paid me. Anyway, so go on. It was just literally like talking in front of a fucking washing machine that was on spin cycle. <laughs> Standing there talking. Yeah. No one's even looking at me. And the noise out of them was terrible. So I went, I'd been on for about two minutes. So I thought, fuck this. And I said, hello, hello. I pretended the mic had gone off. Yeah. I said, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a few technical problems with the mic. I'll be back in five minutes. I ran into the dressing room. There was a door, one of these, you know, crash doors, emergency yeah, exits. Yeah, like a fire exit. Fire exit. I kicked the fucking door, ran through the car park. Yeah. This fella's fucking chasing me. <laughs> Go on. Jumped in my car. As I'm coming out of the car park, this other prick, who was one of the directors of this company, probably knew I was trying to run out the club with the money. He's standing like that, like Jesus on a cross over the gates, trying to stop me car. Yeah. So I just swerved, nearly hit him, and he jumped up in the air. Fuck off, I was gone home. Anyway, that wasn't the end of it. About quarter to nine the next morning, the agent that had given me the job rang me up. And he said, what's happened last night, Frankie? What's happened last night? Mm. They're ringing up. They say they're going to sue you. They say they're going to sue you. They're going to get the police. He said you tried to run over them in the car park. So I just said, no, I didn't. He said, how long were you on for? 
It was about 45 minutes. Fucking good liar, me. Yeah. I said, well, why did he pay me in the first place? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know. I said, he fucking paid me when I came off. He seemed quite happy. Then that was the end of it. I knew I'd cut it close to the bone, but I'd made the 600 fucking pound. Then another bad one I had. I'm working in Preston. This is only about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Get into this club, and it was a labour club. And it was absolutely fucking heaving. A big charity show for this guy who died, but they were paying. Mm. And the guy said, you're on at 10 o'clock after. There was a local young kid on about 16 who was a Michael Bublé tribute act. Okay. So this little kid goes on, nine o'clock. He had all his fucking family in there with him, all up on the balcony, hundreds of people. He had hundreds of supporters. He was a local lad. Just, even for him, it was dead noisy. But when he went, excuse me, when he went on, he brought the house down. He went down great because he was local. He had a good voice. But then I had to go on after him. Yeah. So... I think we were going away on holiday then. So I needed the fucking money. Yeah. And as you, as I've said before, a lot of these clubs, if you didn't go down very well, they would not pay you. Yeah. They just give you half your money or give you nothing. So anyway, I went on about 10 past 10. All of a sudden, hundreds of people started coming out of the bar into the cabaret room. The noise was terrible. And as they're coming in, it reminded me of like the Grand National thousands of horses. Thousands of people making the noise coming Piling in. in. yeah. So I'm on the stage, trying different gags, nothing was working. The noisy, the sweat stripping off me so much, it's splashing onto the fucking floorboards of the stage. And I thought, I need this fucking money. So I'm telling different gags, talking to people in the crowd, what's your name? Anyone celebrating anything? Anyone in from Blackpool, any Black, any Preston fans in? So I'm getting a few little titters. I nearly, literally, my heart nearly come up into my mouth, killed myself trying to get them quiet. Got them a little bit quiet in the end, getting a few laughs, got them to the level where I thought, I think they're going to give me money. Because yeah. I've worked hard with the crowd, I've got a few of them laughing, and I've interacted with them. Anyway, finished. As I'm walking off, going downstairs into the dressing room, this little pokey dressing room, I felt weird. I didn't know whether I was having a fucking heart attack or something. Yeah. And I just went, ah, oh, I just had to sit down. And, like, my breathing all went fucking funny. Mm. And my hand, like, just went like that, like a claw. I thought, what the fuck's this? Am I having a stroke or a heart attack? Yeah. So this prick that's running the club, he comes in. And he goes, oh, you work, Dad. And all they're interested in is how long you've done. Yeah. So he goes, looks at his watch, and he goes, oh, oh, well, you've done a little bit short, but you've done 45 minutes, that'll do. So he fucking paid me. Yeah. But I've never, ever worked so hard in my life on a crowd to try and get the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Work, and literally nearly killed myself. Any other comic... Would have just walked off. He just wouldn't have gone on. Most I stayed on. If there's any comedians that were around now, though, nobody has to do 45 minutes now, really. I to, yeah, but a lot of places they want you to do two 45 minutes. That's what minutes I was spots. curious about. Why the fuck did they want you to do It's just the way it was at the time. Spots. So anyway, so I come off stage. I'm like putting water on my face in this fucking dressing room. I come off, and it must have done something to be affected because I didn't really know where it was. Yeah. It felt weird. So... I remember getting in my car and driving the car and all of a sudden I saw all these lights everywhere, it was all lit up. All I could see was lights, stronger than the lights in here. Mm. And I thought, have I died? Is this, I'm on my way to heaven? Have I died? Or have I been abducted by a UFO mine, a spaceship? All I could see was these lights. I didn't know where it was. And when I looked in the mirror, I could see myself, my eyes were like that. And my mouth just made a funny noise on its own. It went, dub, 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 like that. And I had to put my hands on my face to stop my mouth making this fucking mad noise. So anyway, I got out the car and I'm looking round. 
And I, I was in the garage yeah. with all the lights. I didn't know where it was. And I'm walking round and the fell in the garage, this Indian lad, he, he ran out to me and he went, are you all right, my friend? Are you okay? Mm. And I went, oh. I was going like that. I was going, oh. give me some drinks, give me some drinks. And he got me a Coke. And then, I kept, well, what it must have been, I must have worked that hard on the stage that night. I'd done something to myself. It affected your like nervous system or something. reaction to my nervous system. All right, let me ask you this then, talking about terrible deaths on stage. To any performers, specifically any comedians, yeah. right? Let's say there's aspiring comedians or young comedians out now, even comics that are on the circuit yeah. who might just want a little bit of an extra yeah, kind yeah, of idea yeah. on this. What are, you know, your biggest tips for making sure you do not die on stage when you know it's going to be hard work? When you know it's going to be hard work, if you've got a noisy crowd and you're in the dressing room waiting to go on, what you've got to do is say to the MC, I know they're all fucking idiots, you've got to stress to them, stress to the compare, the MC, fucking sec, whatever they call themselves, Say, so listen, mate, I am not going on tonight unless everyone is quiet. Mm. So then they can go on on the mic and they go, ladies and gentlemen, can you be quiet, please? And after time, they're still not going to be quiet. Can you, I'll ask you again, can you be quiet? Can everyone be quiet? And in the end, they start saying things like, if you keep talking, I'm not going to bring the comedian on. Yeah. So in the end, it gets them quiet. Now, it's kind of like... To get them quiet, you're looking, just look, it's kind of like if you're Mo Salah mm. and you're playing a game and you've got eight defenders in front of you and you want to score a goal, you're looking around and you're looking for a window of opportunity yeah. to score that goal. You know, top like world-class footballers like Salah or Bobby Firmino or something or, you know, my favourite, Divock Origi. <laughs> yeah. Just like a hawk, like a bird in the sky can see a mouse from like half a mile up and swoop down on it and take it. These top footballers can see an opening where they go, okay, there's nine people in front of me. I'll put this fucking ball through your legs, under your fucking arm and turn it round so it goes underneath the goalie. They can do that. I was the same on the stage with compares, you know, sorry, I wasn't the stage. The compares had to be like that, you know, I had to get them quiet. And I had to be like Mo Salah, I had to come on. And when he got them quiet for two minutes, that was my window of opportunity to come on and keep them quiet. Yeah. And then start, place your authority on the crowd. If someone starts talking straight away, say, hey mate, do us a favour. People are trying to listen, be quiet. Yeah. Then you're away then. But if you get introduced when they're noisy, it's far more difficult to get them quiet. You can do it. Now, the strange thing is, Mickey Finn, who was a good mate of mine, died. He was a great comic. Another comedian, I won't name him, approached him. And he said, Mickey, I went to see you and Frankie Allen and Eddie Archer, a good comic, Hal Nolan. We're doing this comedian's night. He said, I noticed as each one of you came out onto the stage and picked the mic up, People went quiet. How do you get them quiet? Now, that's another strange thing about the business. Nobody knows why. One person can walk out on a stage and not be able to get the audience quiet. Somebody else, like I can walk out on any crowd now, not because kind of famous people know me, but even before that, I could walk out to any crowd you're very noisy. Pick the mic up, and as I'm talking, it go very quiet, because I think because you've worked the clubs that many years, and you bring and you look older, you are older or older than you were. You kind of bring to the audience the looking at you, and you look lived in, you look experienced. The way that you're talking, that you see straight away that you've been around, and they'll give you that bit of respect. Whereas they were very, you know, I noticed a lot of young acts. I noticed with Jack Ryan, who does a lot of support work for us. He's a great comedian, but he's only like 25, 27. And uh, with some crowds, not with others, but with a lot of crowds, he can get them a little bit noisy because 
they just they, they don't respect you because they, it's like a set an ageist thing because you're young but as you get older people do respect you a lot more well commanding the authority okay so commanding the authority is, yeah. it, it's gauging the time as well to go on so is a specific time that's better to go on or is there certain things that you can judge in the crowd and go whoa this is getting out of hand yeah, this is going to be well, too you can, with a crowd of people you can get on too early say for instance if anybody arrives in a club at 7 o'clock mm-hmm. hanging the coats up you're standing the fucking coats up in this club they had these brollies and things and they, these bastards used to wear these Pacamac things in the 80s anyone remember them it was like a bit of cellophane over the fucking head and tied underneath under the chin so they'd be in the club at half past seven. The highlights of the club, not me, not the comedian or the singer or the group, they're all there for the bingo. Mm. Trying to win fucking ten quid. So you were just like a fucking, you know, sideline. You just, not no importance. And with you being unknown, it was very, very difficult. So, yeah, you'd, you'd go on early in a lot of these places. And if the agents had you doing two clubs in one night, they'd have you on a quarter to eight. People had just got out the fucking bath. There were still people coming into the club. They hadn't even had a drink. They didn't feel loose. They didn't feel in a good mood. They were still kind of like a home mentally. You know, they weren't even used to being in the club. So it was hard to get them laughing. And then between nine o'clock and half past nine was always a great time to get on the social clubs. Ten o'clock in a pub is a good time because people are been there and they kind of chill, get relaxed in a pub after 10 o'clock. But it's a strange thing because all the years I've done thousands, thousands of shows in rough pubs, worked on barges, on aeroplanes, every kind of, in a lift, every venue, thousands of people, 20 people in the club. What you find with a lot of places that you're entertaining, if you go on a club at nine o'clock, for the first 45 minutes, it'll go down well. If you put it on after 10, it's a bit more difficult to get the order, but you can still go down great and go down very well. In the clubs, if you went on, after 11 o'clock, that was your death sentence. Yeah. You just die. Very difficult to stop them talking. But what I discovered by accident, really, and helped me out over the years... If you've got a crowd that were good at 9 o'clock, good at 10, good at 10.30, started getting very noisy at 11 o'clock, the trick was not to go on at 11. Wait. Wait till after 12, Mm. and they get a tiny bit sleepy, so they go quiet, and they turn into a good audience again. Interesting. And I've done shows at 3 and 4 in the morning, where it's fascinating, really, very complicated people, the way the people react at different times of the day. People on a Sunday afternoon, the shows I did, were always up for a laugh. People on a Friday night were always more difficult to entertain than people who went out on a Saturday. Yeah. The fun pubs in the Less 80s pissed, and 90s... Is that because they're out after work? Well, I don't know. You know, it, it's a lot of factors come into play. But the fun pubs in the 80s, people were coming out during the weekends to the fun pubs, you went on at 10 o'clock, but maybe it was because you were working on the bar in a big pub, a big kind of like nightclub bar, working on the bar. They were all standing in front of you. You always went well. Yeah. It was only the social clubs with the very old people that you'd get a bad time. So key things, make sure you get on at the right time. Make sure you get to them quiet. Well, no, your checklist for any young kids out there who's starting off as a comedian, get to the venue Find out who's fucking running it. Find out who the MC is that's going to bring you on stage. Yeah. If they haven't got one, see if they can get, you know, if they can deputise someone to do it. Get someone to introduce you on stage. Make sure that the light is switched on, on the stage, shining on your face, so they can see you. Mm -hmm. Make sure as well, which has happened to me hundreds of times, that when you're brought on stage telling your jokes, that they haven't got fucking music playing all over the club. Or a buffet. That's another one, yeah. <laughs> okay. Or sometimes they've introduced you onto the fucking stage and then while you're on telling jokes, a fella grab the other mic and go, 
Right, Buffy time. Get your Buffy. So hundreds of people you're trying to entertain queuing up for fucking food. Another one you used to love doing. Wait, there, I've got one that, that is very, very important. Go on. Never let an established comedian who's been going for long go on before you. If you're coming on as a novice... As a novice? Yeah. You can't afford to go on, on any... On, on after anyone who's Kil- established... Kilvo, yeah. Our support comedian, James Kilvington, he went to this private show, second ever gig. It was a very, very established, well-known comedian who I won't name on this podcast. Yeah. But he said to him, what do you want to do? And Kilvo was dead naive. And the lad said to him, tell you what, I'll go on first, you go on after me. Yeah. He said he did 45 minutes... And he said, then everyone just went to bar and he was fucked. Just destroyed physically and mentally. So you've got to make sure, that's your checklist, that they don't introduce the buffet. Because these people that run the clubs are just fucking idiots. Mm. Half of them are like bus drivers in the daytime or bin men, whatever they are. So they'd get you on and sometimes they'd introduce the fucking buffet. Another thing is, as you're on, they send packs of these fucking birds around. Oh, Selling raffles. bingo tickets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Selling raffle tickets. Yeah, heavy. Then other times, a fella used to come into the club when you were on, selling cockles and fucking mussels. Yeah, but that's years ago. It wouldn't happen Yeah, now, but no, but when it was still, I had to put up with it for 20 years. Tell everyone the story about that if they haven't seen it before. It. <laughs> no, I don't want to tell that story Go again, on. Will. No, it's too long. It's too, I'll do it another time. All right. But that's what you're up against. You've got these idiots... Or maybe sometimes they've had a singer on before they introduce you onto the stage. Yeah. So they leave the echo on, which is the reverb, reverb, which makes you feel as though you're singing in a cave. So if they give you the mic that the singer's just been using and the reverb hasn't been turned off and these fucking idiots had never turned it off, you've got to make sure it's off. You go on stage and as you go on, you're going... <laughs> So you just die. No one yeah, can hear you. Yeah. Because the reverb's on. So all these things are like set against you. It's very, very difficult. You've got to make sure. I've been to loads of places where as you're on, you can hear fucking mute dancing. I was on the stage one night in Manchester. I'm telling jokes. I can hear, you can dance, you can dance. So I have to say to the fellow, where's the music coming from? And he goes, oh, it's coming from jukebox. I will fucking turn it off. <laughs> yeah. They're just fucking idiots. So then you have to switch it off. Sometimes you on can that go on note, stage. TVs off. Get the TVs off in the room and get flashing lights off. Another thing is what you've just said. During the 80s and 90s, yeah. you do a lot of these places, fun pubs where they had like, you know, a fucking like um, a drag act on. And what the drag acts used to do, they'd be going on spinning the discs all dressed up, and a, a woman and all, and these pubs. And they'd have all, like, coloured lights, flashing lights, and this fucking smoke used to come out. If I went to one place, this is a good example of how bad it used to be. Yeah. This place in Scunthorpe, called Henry Africa. Henry Africa's all over Britain. Fucking big, huge fun pubs. And there's a big walkway, like walking a plank. The crowd are miles away. So as I walk down this fucking plank with the mic to entertain, he goes, here he is, Frankie Allen, presses these fucking buttons. Mm. Dry ice it is, actually. Smoke comes from everywhere. No one can see you. Yeah. Then you put all these fast flashing lights on. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of these dickhead fucking DJs, yeah. and you've been with me when it's happened, you're telling jokes. And because... They're not the centre of attention because nobody's looking at them anymore. Yeah. Do you start talking while you're on, where on the that, mic? Where was that place you went to in Wales? Oh, this was this. Listen to this. This was this fucking dickhead that was on in um, Wales in Patheli. Patheli, yeah. Patheli Golf Club. <laughs> and a mate of ours, young Dave, who was a cracking lad, and we take him with him to Wales because he lived in Wales for years. He worked at Butler's. <laughs> He had a great job there in entertainment. Yeah, it was a good he? show, to be fair. And he, he, he's fluent in Welsh, Dave, so he can, if there's areas that don't really speak English, you can trust it. So we're in this fucking club in Wales. Yeah. So there's this dickhead there, look like a throwback from 1980s. <laughs> he had this fucking hair, big hair like Scooby-Doo, about 60. Yeah. With this ridiculous 
Hawaiian shirt on from 1972. Yeah. Now, I know the bit behind the times in some places in Wales, but I thought, what the fuck? So, I go on stage. I'm telling jokes, and he's in the corner with his fucking headphones on. So, I go, yeah, this fellow, and I have to finish the fucking joke. He goes, hockey, hockey, hockey. <laughs> Presses this fucking button and this music comes on. <laughs> well, my blood was fucking boiling. Yeah. Done this other gag. I told the gag, it comes to the end and he goes, on the mic, I could hear it everywhere. He goes, Oggy, Oggy, Oggy. <laughs> oi, oi, oi. I went, you fucking stupid cunt. <laughs> Put the mic in the stand, I walked over to him and I said, what the fucking hell are you doing? Yeah. Just looked at me. I said, hey, mate, fuck off now. Switch your music on and fuck off. And I got back on the mic and I said, ladies, I'm sorry about that. And I couldn't. And afterwards, he came up to me, just a fucking total dickhead. And he went, I'm sorry. I thought I was helping you, Frankie. I love to do my oggy, oggy, oggy. I said, oggy, fucking oggy, mate. I'm working on my own. I'm a comedian. I don't need you to fuck are you. Yeah. I don't need you. Okay, so at the end of that, I've, I've oh. thought of an, another piece of advice. So we'll give, we're giving people some good insights here. One thing is you cannot let somebody be visible on stage at the same time as you. How often does that happen? And tell people what I mean by that. I've got a mate. I'll tell this story. You might watch this podcast, Peter. He's a good lad and everything. But in a lot of ways, he's a fucking idiot. And uh, when I first started working in the clubs, I hadn't seen him for years. He was coming round with me. He's like a fucking duck. He was like following me around the clubs. Where are you going now? He comes to clubs now sometimes, doesn't he? Yeah. And he's going, where are you going now? Where are you going now? I'm just turning everywhere to turn around, he's standing behind me. Yeah. So one night I'm walking in the dressing room and I couldn't get in the dressing room because he's behind me and as I'm trying to close the door, he's standing right there, yeah. follow me everywhere as though he was attached to me. Yeah. Anyway, he gets to this club in Leicester, Peter's with me. Now he wears a fucking big hat, like a cowboy hat. <laughs> like one of them. Like one of those. Yeah. It's called a... <laughs> What what is he called it? A fedora or something? A fedora. Fedora. Yeah. He wears this fucking fedora. And he's like gangster suits from the eighties and a big tie. So this is no exaggeration now. Get down to this hotel in Leicester. Pieces with me. Now this fucking night, he was wearing this fucking fedora, but he had a big huge <laughs> leather jacket on, like Clint Eastwood. In the outlaw Josie Wales. Yeah. This fucking leather jacket was like something <laughs> from a fucking movie. What was that movie? Fistful of Dollars. Huge black leather jacket, leather coat, right down to his ankles, nearly touching the floor. He's a big lad, he's like that. He's got this fucking big hat on. So, anyway, so I said to the DJ, What time are you putting me on? He said, I'll put you on in a minute. So, all these lads were lorry drivers from all over the UK. There was about 200 of them sitting there. So there was no stage area, so I had to go on on the floor. Yeah. So I had to go on on the floor, I'm telling jokes. I just saw something out of the corner of my eye. So I turned around, it's Peter. He's not standing at the bar. He used to stand at the bar sometimes, but everyone could see him. He's not standing by the stage. He's standing about six inches away from me. He's standing next to me on the stage. Yeah. So everyone's looking. Just like you are with me now, but a lot closer. Yeah. I'm telling jokes, and he's, he's standing there. <laughs> with, with a big fucking, fucking big ass on. So I had to say, one minute, ladies and gentlemen, just one minute. I said, Peter, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Fuck off. Get off the fucking stage. So we had to walk away. And then it's harder then get to get the crowd yeah. when they've seen you shouting at someone. But it's it's when the crowd are looking, you know, I can see it even when I'm hosting or whatever, we always say in the ride or when we got to venues, you cannot be 
have anybody visible, whether why? that be a DJ or Look, a sound technician or whatever. Why would you want to be on? Why do people want to be on stage with you? And we've had it with kind of like when we were in Coventry, we were on with Anthony Joshua and we got introduced. I got introduced on, I'm not sure who introduced me, mm. but as I'm on, there's these two bouncers, they were like big fellas, about 20 stone, six foot two, standing next to me. But they're standing right fucking next to me. Yeah. They just feel important. So they want, so I had to say, look, lads, you can't stand there. Yeah. You know, the number of times I've had to give stage directions while I'm on stage, I've had to say, ladies and gentlemen, sorry, I'll have to stop until the lights are turned on. We're, we're in yeah, the dark, yeah, yeah. I'm afraid. Yeah. And they're all dicker. It takes them fucking 20 minutes to put the lights on. Or I've had to say, ladies and gentlemen, I can't carry on until they switch the music off. Yeah. You just can't believe the obstacles that are in your path towards having a good night. The few things that I would recommend are what you've said. Lights, make sure there's no raffles or buffet going to go on during your performance. I'd always say underestimate the amount of time you're going to do because that can be a problem with people, okay. can't it? You know, if people say, sometimes to get a job, you'll go, oh, I'll do, I'll do half an hour for you and you've only got 15 minutes. That's right. Then, <laughs> then there's no way. I mean, that must have happened to you loads of times. It's happened to me sometimes where, especially, there's a good trick I came up with. During the 70s and 80s, when I first started, I was only fucking 20, 19, I think, 76, 75, 70. You had to do two 45-minute spots in the club. Yeah. Used to get like 40 quid for the night. I was doing impressions, so I had a suitcase with props in. Now, the number of places that me and my mate Danny went to, Danny Dowling started at the same time as me. He's a comedian in Spain. And he's a brilliant comedian, by the way. He's very good. He's great. We get to these fucking clubs, and I had no car. So I had to get to the bus, to the club, try and do the show, get the money, and uh, try and, like, hitchhike home or sleep sometimes in a bus shelter or a fucking railway station. Yeah. Sometimes, if you work in Manchester or Yorkshire, the agent, who was a Liverpool agent, who put you in there, had put a group in as well. So there was a good chance they were from Liverpool, so you could always get a lift back off them. Yeah. So I'm working, going around the clubs, no transport, totally unknown, looked as though I was seven mm. on stage with this little tiny body I had. Little skinny fucking grey suit. And I could only do 20 minutes. That's all the material I had. So what I had to use, what I used to do was bluff my way through. I try not to go on when they wanted me to go on at nine o'clock. And I'd say to the fella, put me on in a few minutes. There's a few people at the bar. So if I could steal 20 minutes. You're buying yourself a bit of time. Buying yourself another 20 minutes. So when I'd done my 20 minutes, he looked at his watch. Oh yeah, that's a quarter to 10. We can do the bingo now. Got you. Doesn't realise that I wasn't until nine o'clock. But when they wanted me back on to do another spot, I couldn't do it because I didn't have the material. Yeah. So what I started saying was, look, I do a lot of impressions. I'd already done them in the first half. The second half, I do a lot of impressions. But my car got broken into last night. All my props have been stolen. All my glasses and wigs, everything's been stolen. I can't do them. Yeah. If you've done well in the first half, they'd say, well, never mind then. We'll just put the group back on. Yeah. You'd get away with it. A lot of places got me into a bit of trouble where they only give me half the money. And there's a comedian who's dead now. This guy was a fantastic comedian, a scouser called Johnny Mack. Johnny Mack, he wore glasses. He went on Opportunity Knocks in 1975 and he came second. And he went on with the Lord Mayor of Liverpool. I use some of his material now, it's very funny. He's the guy, he used to do very silly gags, like, um, my missus broke a leg in three places last night. I said to her, you want to keep out of those places? Got you. The doctor said, look, I'm going to put this plaster of Paris on your leg. Don't go climbing any stairs with this plaster on your leg. She used to make a terrible noise at night, trying to get up the drain pipe to get into bed. <laughs> Uh, she had a face, this girl had a face, a hyena who wouldn't laugh at. All those gags, some of the gags I use, I was going out with this girl, she was dead, dead skinny. 
She was that skinny. When she went to bed, she looked like a rip in the sheet. Yeah. She swallowed the pickled onion and six fellas left town. All these gangs. She was very clever, very good. Johnny Mac. He was kind of a hero of mine. And I was in a bar one night in a pub that he was working on. I'd been working. And he said, how's it going, Frank? And I said, Johnny, I'm having a bad time with these two spot things in the clubs. He said, how do you mean? I said, well, I haven't got an hour and a half of material. Mm. So he says, okay. He said, I've had this. This happened to me years ago. When they say you, they want you on twice, just say, okay, that's fine, great. Yep. Another trick. Any comedians out there, if the old any of the old circuit's still going, here's a bit of good advice for you. So he'd say, don't try and do 15 minutes in the first half and then save some material to the second half because they'll chase you anyway. They'll say you're no good and they won't pay you. Go on at nine o'clock, do your whole act, mm. do every gag you've ever thought of, Stand there asking, is anyone celebrating anything? Is anybody's birthday? Any Everton fans in, give us a wave. Any Man United fans, he talk, oh, Billy, the concert secretary, give him a boo, let's all boo Billy. Or, try and waste time. Do everything you can to bring you up to a quarter to ten. Yeah. Come off. I said, what do we do when I go back on? A quarter past ten? Yeah. And if this is very true, it's true this, but quite funny. He said, don't do anything. I said, what do you mean? Yeah. He said, just stand there. I said, just stand there yeah. with no material. He said, stand there because when you've done the 45 minutes, you can say to them, look, what time am I going back on? Quarter past 10, okay. Uh, will you pay me, please? And uh, they've got to pay you okay, then. Okay, got you. They have to pay you at half time because they've seen you can do 45 minutes. And they've seen you being So good. they think you're going to do another 40. So get the fucking money off them. Walk out. It's, and I've done it hundreds of times. Yeah. In the end, started rehearsing a little bit of rubbish material. And what I started doing, another good fucking bit of advice to young comics out there, if you haven't got much material, get a suitcase... Mm. write out hundreds, a lot of gags inside the suitcase on paper, sellotape the paper to the inside of the suitcase and leave it on a chair where you can see it, but the audience can't. I, you used to do a newspaper routine as well. Yeah, I'll tell them about the, the newspaper routine now. And um, as you're telling gags, you can glance over at the suitcase. People think the suitcase is there because you've got to do impressions. Yeah. But you're not. You don't have to use the case. They just think, what's he got to do now? And they forget about it. So you keep looking at the lid of the suitcase or the inside of it, and it says, airplane routine. You go, oh, yeah, I haven't done that yet. I'll do my airplane routine. And underneath it says, butcher's routine. So do your butcher's routine. Got you. So it's great. It could remind you. And you could get a lot more time out of that. Another thing I used to do, if you're on with the band, they'd always have two huge speakers on with them, the PA system. Yeah. The PA system, big black fucking cabs, they call them, six foot high. All you do, loads of gags, write them on a piece of paper, sellotape them to the back of the fucking speaker. Yeah. You're in the middle of the stage, you walk around a little bit, every now and then, glance over, it's only a couple of feet, at the back of the speaker and see your gags. Yeah. And that'll remind you. And the third thing is the newspaper one. The third thing, there was a comedian called Don Reed going around in the 70s. You used to do this routine, reading the news from newspaper. I'll tell you some of the gags, because they're quite good, really. You go, ladies and gentlemen, Scottish fellas in court today accused of having sex with a cat. The judge said, I don't believe a Scotsman would put anything in a kitty. Then he'd go, um, thieves have broken into a police station this morning, stolen all the toilets and fittings. The police have nothing to go on. Mm. Thieves have broken into Edge Lane Fruit Market and stolen half a ton of fresh lettuce at the same time as a tobacconist was burgled. £10,000 worth of uh, tobacco has been stolen. The police say, be on the lookout for a rabbit with a bad cough. Got it, yeah, just it was like silly gags, silly or they'd say, the police have discovered a huge hole on the M62. They are looking into it. 
Got you. All these gags. But what you could do, people thought that the gags were in your head. Yeah. But you could have them in the paper, sellotape to the inside of the paper, the gags. Yeah. But on the other page, have written out the next routine that you're going to do. And it'll say Chinese routine. I'm going to do the Chinese routine. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do the gag about... And, and as you're getting your laughs with the gags that you're reading, the next page is telling you about your next routine. Ugly routine, so ugly. When she was a kid, they had to feed her with a catapult. Then little arrows taking you down to another little box on your white sheet of paper, stuck to the paper on the inside pages, about, oh, yeah, the holiday routine. So you could get away with it that way. And very often, if you got stuck, every comedian will tell you, you can be on stage, it happens to me now, you're in full flow, doing all your gags, suddenly you can get a mental block. And you don't know what the fuck to say. Yeah. But you could do okay with that now, because you just buy for time and say, you play for time. Who are you, mate? What's your name? I'd a crowd say, interaction. you know, any Everton fans in, then suddenly... Come back to you. It'll come back to you. But in the early days... Even when I was a kid, if you got a mental block, you didn't have any, you didn't know what to do. So you had to walk off. So let's look at the keys. Key things are make sure there's no raffle or buffet. Make sure the mic's okay and it's decent. I'd say, make sure bring, you're not I'd the, say bring your make own Make sure mic. you're not in the dark. Make sure you're not in the dark. Make sure there's lights on. Make sure there's no effects on the microphone. There's no reverb. Yeah, bring your own or make sure you know what you're doing with the mix. Try and make sure as well in a lot of these clubs, you know, this has happened to me. Some of the places when they're doing the bingo, they open up a partition in the middle of the club. Big wooden partition, all these doors hinged together. Yeah. Crosby comrades have got one. Yeah. They pull this partition apart when they're doing the bingo so the people that are in the lounge... In the other room can see. In the other room can see what's going on. Yeah. But most of the time they don't close it. Yeah. So you're going on, so the room is twice the size as it should have been. Yeah. And the people who are in the lounge who don't want to come in to watch the comedian... Yeah. Aren't interested in you. Of course. Make sure that, you know, there's not a lot of people at the bar when you go in or they will, they will be noisy. Make sure that, as I say, there's no one coming in selling food. There's no one selling raffle tickets. We've also covered, make sure that there is nobody visible next to you on the stage. Or make sure there's no one standing stadium. next to you on the stage. The next part is make sure that if the stage is too far away from the audience, you work off the floor. Because you've got to be some walk close to the audience. The other thing as well, I want to bring to people's attention if you're starting off as a comic, don't be browbeaten by a lot of these acts who think they're big time. And what I mean so by that... So many of them. Get a lot of big time groups or they think they're big time, they're fucking rubbish. They're kind of jealous of the comedian because the comedian comes along, gets on the mic, does an hour or whatever or 40 minutes he can do now gets a few hundred quid, gets paid more than they do. And they're on stage all night. They have to carry these speakers and guitars and drums. Yeah. And a big kind of light and rig, sound rig. And they kind of jealous. So what you used to get, what I've experienced over the years, a lot of groups will go on stage and when they're only supposed to do half an hour, they'll try and kill it. For the comedian. Yeah. They'll stay on for an hour and a half. Mm. So by the time they put the comedian on, the comedian has a bad time. Yeah. They've been on too long. They've milked the audience. So, and, and this goes, you know, when you're working with other comics, some of them, if they're going down well, they won't come off. Yeah. So that's another thing you've got to watch. Prima donnas, people who think they're big time, if they're going well. I've done loads of places where as I've got older and I've got more known and kind of like semi-famous I used to be, people had a bit of respect for me. I've been able to go into places and I've seen some prick on stage, a comedian, a young kid or something that's going down well and because he's going well, he's doing too long and he's going to kill it for me mm. when I go on. I've just said to the secretary, of it, get him off right now or I'm gone. Yeah. You've got to just be, you've got to really be, be that firm. firm with them and they've gone, come off. And even then you get some of these bastards who won't come off. And they're going, what, give me five minutes off. And then I've got to switch them off, switch them off. Yeah. Final thing before we wrap this up. But if you are asked to do two separate spots on the same night, do not let somebody do a fucking disco or a karaoke or anything in between. 
But it's going to ruin the crowd. That's happened it? to us in Doncaster. Yeah. That's happened to us in fucking Huddersfield, Birmingham. Before we had our tech rider in place and stuff like that, because people will just go, oh, and next minute there's fucking lights everywhere and all that. And now you're supposed to go on and get attention after that. You know, there really is. People think you just walk into a club, you get on stage. I mean, fucking hell, the trouble that goes on. A lot of these clubs, there's a good uh, little story I'll finish on this one. A lot of these social clubs are very jealous of each other. They hate each other. Yeah. They're trying to get the best acts for their club. They may, may be a British Legion club. Club down the road, they may have a better group than they've got on the night. So they build up this rivalry where they hate each other. Yeah. So what they hate, I went to this club, it was only about 10 years ago, I went to this club in Liverpool and there was another club that wanted me to do a spot which was in the same fucking street. Yeah. So they were 100 yards away from each other. Yeah. One was like a town hall thing. One was this fucking club. When I got to this club, I knew, the, I knew the fella was going to start being weird with me because they hear people say to him, oh, no, Frankie's on there. They don't want you working for anyone else. They think they've got sole exclusivity on you yeah. for the night. Yeah. They think they've hired you for the fucking night, but they haven't. Mm. So I get to this club. So I'm on the club down the road. I'm on the club down the road about 10 o'clock. I said, I oh, know in this club, it's like this fucking... Can I say the club or not say it really? Say it, yeah, I'm not asked. This club is like in Liverpool and Garston called the uh, Victoria Memorial Club. Like this Orange Lodge fucking thing, a hall club. So anyway, the fella came up to me and he went, I knew he was doing it deliberately. I said, look, um, and normally, you know, the, the comedian always goes on at nine o'clock. So put me on at nine. So I'll be finished by a quarter ten. I'll be gone quarter to ten. Straight to the other club, and I've made good money. Mm. And like, oh no, he says, uh, I'm putting the group on at nine o'clock. I said, You're putting a fucking group on at nine o'clock? Why are you doing that, mate? Yeah. Oh no, I want the group on at nine o'clock. I knew it was because of the other club. Yeah. He did, it was on. So I said, Fucking hell, what time are the group doing? He said, Well, they're doing about 45 minutes. I said, Okay. So then he said, But then I'm, I want to do the Buffy. I said, so quarter to ten, you're doing the Buffy. So, so I'll be going on about 20 past ten. He said, yeah. So that's ridiculous. No comedian goes on 20 past ten. He said, I want you on at 20 past ten. I said, okay. Well, I said, I'll tell you what. We know, both know what we're talking about here. You know I'm doing another club down the road. And he just looked at me. I said, so take it easy with the Buffy. Let them have a good walk around. I'll go on, get on here about a quarter to 11. That's right. And he went, no, I'm not doing that. I want you on. He was trying to nail me boots to the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He must have been lying awake all night, tossing and turning. How can I fuck Frankie Allen up? It's all the control thing. Control isn't it? thing. Weird. I'll get him on at twenty past ten. Then it'll be too late to to go on at the other club mm. and too early to come back to mine or whatever the fuck it was. So I said, "Okay, mate." I said, "Listen, mate, you're just being funny with me." So then he said. It's another trick that you do. He said, there's a phone call for you. He said, a fucking phone call for me. Walked into this big long room that they do all the Masonic things, a big chair like Alice in Wonderland. And the phone was on the end of the table, like fucking uh, Dr. Strangelove, yeah. the movie. <laughs> yeah. And all these fellas, these dickheads, these old men all standing there like that. I said, what's this? There's a phone call for you. And I picked the phone call up and it was the agent. Yeah. They phoned the agent. And say, phone back, we'll get it. And so the agent starts shouting at me, why aren't you going on when you're told to go on? I said, look, mate, I'll go on at nine o'clock. I'll go on half nine or I'll go on half ten. I'm not going on at quarter past fucking ten. He's trying to ruin me night. I'm doing another club down the road. So he starts shouting at me. I said, hey, mate, do me a favour. Fuck off. Mm. So I walked up to this prick who would being funny with me. I said, listen, mate, so you want me on at 20 past ten? He said, yeah. I said, okay. I said, I'll tell you what. I've got a great idea. This is going to work. He said, yeah. what is it? I said, what do you do? And he said, well, I work in this car place. I said, great. I said, you go on at 20 past 10. Yeah. And you go on until quarter past 11. You tell them all jokes. You can do it, mate. You do it. What did he say? 
what are you talking about? How can I go on? I said, fuck off. And he walked out. Yeah. Went to the other club. I wasn't asked then. And the agent's ringing up. They're going to sue you. I said, tell him to sue me. So where he made the mistake is I know the law, consider, you know, over-performing art, performance yeah. art. So my contract was with the agent, yeah, not with the club. Your contract's not with the club, no. And my contract, as you know, much more than me, because you studied at university for years, he would have had to sue me, and then the club sue him. But I wasn't even in breach of contract, because I didn't have a contract, and the verbal contract was performance of 45 minutes. Time, TBA. Always usually is TBA, arranged. TBC. And all it was, we didn't reach a mutual agreement about the time. That I, but I'd offered the time in, so I, I knew I was in the clear. Perfect. So look, They couldn't accommodate me. Let's give people three takeaways. If you're a performer, yeah. if you're a comedian, what are your three biggest takeaways to make sure that a live performance goes well? Get the audience quiet. Make sure somebody introduces you and has the ability to get the crowd quiet, get them to give you a good introduction, to state your name very loud. You've just come trying to give you a bit of a lift. He's just come back from a tour of, yeah, there's, you know, a, whatever. there's a lot of people that will give little cards to the MC or whatever. Yeah, people give that. cards, read this out. Yeah. Some of it's humorous. I think that's decent. I think that's good. Yeah, you've got, you know, it's not my cup of tea. A lot of the comedian Denny Waters, he does it. He says to the MC, will you introduce me? Denny Waters, a Liverpool comedian. He says, will you introduce me? And say, this guy, he's just come, uh, he's just come home today. He's been on a tour of the, Turkey and Yeah, Sweden. don't give away his gag, though. Oh, no, don't give away his gag. Okay, yeah, that's sad. But he does it. You know, and if it works for him, it works for him, great. But I don't like doing that kind of stuff. But as you say, your main things are, make sure you get introduced. Make sure that the stage lights aren't flashing about and that they're shining on you. Make sure the DJ, who normally are all dickheads, doesn't have music on when you are on the stage. Make sure he doesn't have the room full of smoke. Mm. Make sure he doesn't have all these fucking lights going like this when you're on. And most importantly, make sure that your microphone is in the system and it's not on echo and people can hear you and understand you. Make sure you look smart, you know, a nice suit on or whatever you want to wear, but make sure you look clean and that's giving you some command of the crowd. You're not supposed to be. A lot of these alternative comedians run on in a pair of jeans and a T-shirt. So what you're doing, you're making yourself just one of the audience. It's fine if you look smart, though. That's what I've just said. Yeah. Look smart. You can be casual, but I would rather wear a suit because people are coming to see you as someone who's got a special talent. Yeah, horses so, of course. Horses of I'd, course. I'd say well, that's my opinion. Suit, yeah. To look a little bit better, a bit more well-dressed than the average person. Okay, so going to wrap this up. want to say big thanks to everyone for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, really, really appreciate all the support we've been getting on the podcast. It's been massive last few weeks. This is episode five now. Is it episode sure, six? Really. I don't know. It, yeah. It's around that time. But big thanks to everyone for listening. If you've enjoyed it, please do give us a rating on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts um, and give us a thumb up on the video. Make sure you comment below. If you are an aspiring comedian and you want any more advice or you'd like to try and try your hand try com 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 you know, coming on one of know. our shows, drop us a message, whether it be on Facebook, Instagram, whatever, or email me, um, bookings at frankieallen.co.uk, or you can get me at will at willcranny.com, and uh, we'll try and help you out as much as we can. Final thing before we go, Frank, give us a big plug on the Stanley Park, Isla Gladstone, on Liverpool show. Saturday, the 8th of August. I'm performing, Will Cranny here is emceeing, James Kilberson is supporting, there's three acts on, basically, on the Isle of Gladstone, which is the name for the area outside the Palm House, the Glass House in Stanley Park. It's an open-air show, but we're going to be working, I'll be working off of the um, bandstand, we'll have a full PA system there, there'll be lights, they'll all be seated, it's going to be fantastic. 200 people there, it's, oh, plus it's got to be a great night. And it's the first show that we've done. It's our comeback show since March, so it's going to be a special night. So try, if you can, 
to get a ticket and come along there. Um, Saturday the 8th of August 2020 at the Isle of Gladstone, Stanley Park, opposite Everton. In Liverpool. So you can get your tickets for that either on Eventbrite or on Skiddle. Uh, they're all listed at frankieallen.co.uk on the main page, on the Facebook page, or whatever. The tickets are flying. Flying out to you know, well. we're, we're At the moment, we're gonna we're struggling as to whether how many numbers we can do based on the fact that it's not a driving show. It's fully outdoor. It's all social distanced. You have to buy your tickets in bubbles of twos, fours, or sixes. They're only 15 quid ahead fucking get yourself there because it's going to be a good night and you know what scousers are like Frank when it's sold out last minute our phones are going to blow up aren't your they? phone will blow up I mean when we done Tenerife a couple of years ago it sold out at the Sky Bar the first performance or the only performance we were supposed to do one night we sold out in an hour so the guy the bars asked us will he do another one so uh, we booked in the following night we were free anyway so we done the following night and uh, that was sold out. It took a couple more hours to sell that one out. Then he had to build extra seats and he got some joiners and carpenters because the demand was so... But he said to me, what I've got, he said, I'm getting calls here, he said, and slightly threatening as well, he said, all Scousers, <laughs> hey, mate? Because Scousers, as you know, do everything at the last minute. Hey. You won't think of buying a ticket. You'll just think of turning up on the night. Yeah. And then when you say you can't get in, they can't understand it. They start saying things like, we yeah, are fellas, I'm of Frankies. <laughs> what do you mean I can't get in, mate? He's from fucking Kensington. I used to live by his house. Yeah. You, mean, you mean I can't? Oh, all right, mate. Hang on a minute, mate. I'm fucking coming to see you. That's what they're like. They get a little bit frustrated. They can't keep the cool. So any scousers, get your tickets early. <laughs> then you won't have to kick off and threaten to shoot the fella who's selling the tickets. Nice one. So tickets available at Eventbrite, <laughs> at Skiddle, uh, all online. Big, big thank you to everyone who's listened, everyone who's watching. And as this little piano music's playing now, Frank, you love this music, don't this you? This music he plays, <laughs> plays us on with this and out. It's like something from the 60s when you used to go to pictures when you were a kid. It's just fucking silly. <laughs> nice one. Big thanks to everyone for tuning in. Thanks Get yourself subscribed if you haven't already, and we'll see you later. See you later. Thanks, bye. Nice one.